I'm excited to be here, and I'm also awed and amazed because the Lord was reminding me once again, and if I get emotional, I don't care, because at my age, being Italian and Irish, we cry about everything, um, even when it's good news. You should see, you think I'm bad, you should see my father. Um, um, I was 15 years old. I grew up in Philadelphia, and we moved to the boonies because my parents had some delusion we were going to live like the Waltons. And uh, if you're old enough, you know what I'm talking about. And um, I was in a Bible study. I was 15 years old. I still remember this clear as day. These older saints standing around me, laying hands on me and praying. And this is what they said. So this was almost 40 years ago. We see you standing in the churches of New England, sharing the word of the Lord. That's why I'm here because God had a plan and he spoke it through some people in a prophetic way that amazed me. And I didn't plan this, I didn't look for this, I forget those types of words. And I just go, okay, well that'll be interesting because I just want to be a farm veterinarian, so leave me alone. Um, one of those things. So I stand in awe of God's ability. It's not your ability to follow him, it's his ability to lead you. And we as Western Christians have spent too much time managing our faith rather than living in it. And it is my passion for the body of Christ to discover how beloved you are and to be a love army that in just not in some cheap, romantic, cheesy Hollywood, we go have a commercial, break up, go have another commercial, kiss and make up, okay? Um, to be a people that know what it is to be named from their Father in heaven. The thing I love about the Lord is he gives us many access points to his identity. He is singular, he is one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the interesting thing about that is God allows us to access him in any one of those points. So if you have daddy issues, guess what? Go to Jesus, he's your best friend. He'll help you deal with his father. Yeah, some of you are getting it. Those of you are like, you know, Jesus thing, kind of messy, not sure I like him. Um, Holy Spirit, your comforter, go to him. You understand? So I want to just take a few minutes to talk about living as people in our identity and intimacy and invitation in the Trinity, which sounds very dry, but if you hold on long enough, you'll be excited by the end of this, I promise. And I think we've lost that. Churches tend to land on certain imageries of what the church is. It's either a hospital or an army or um, a tower or a fortress or a lighthouse or a resource place. Um, and each one of those images is correct. And just like with the body of Christ, there's certain images for the body of Christ. And so I can go into churches and quickly pick up on what image they've landed on. Just by how they interact with each other, just how they teach. You know, when I grew up, God was king on the throne. It was kind of the, there's a fancy word for this, Tatilis argument, where he like wound the world up and took a vacation for a while. You know, he just set things in motion and went, good luck storming the castle, hope it works out. You know, the, the worst version of Princess Bride. So, um, and so there was never this idea of God as father, as one who cares and names for us and protects us. You know, so we go through seasons and revelations of that. So I just want to share a couple things. One is the orthodox teaching of the church about the Trinity is one God, three persons. Not one God, three faces. Three faces is called modalism. It is an error and it is not orthodox Christianity. By the way, there's nothing new as far as doctrinal error goes because the church wrestled through this in the first 300 years. So I'm always laughing when fat white guys like me get up and go, oh, I've had this new revelation about really what God was trying to say for the last 2,000 years. Please sit down and shut up. He is three distinct persons, and they each have a personality, and yet they're one. And if I was starting a religion, this is not how I'd start the basic doctrine of my religion. Do you realize that? This is really whacked. You know, I get friends from other religions going, you know, that is just the strangest thing about Christianity. You know, these three things and one and like, uh, like that's just, uh, and I go, I know, I, hey, I didn't make it up. You know, it's just what it is, all right? And I think at times as Christians, we just need to say, I don't know. That's why it's called the mystery of faith. Oh, there's a novel idea. As people in the Western world, we think we've got to give answers for everything. I don't have the answers. 
right? So I can't tell you why it's that way. It's going to be one of my questions. But here's the image of God as Father. It is the most common image that God, Jesus in the New Testament brings to us to introduce God to us. It's quite radical. Because up to this point, the tradition in the, the Judaic tradition, the Hebrew tradition, you couldn't even say God's name. And here Jesus is coming and going, he is your father, which immediately puts him at a relational, intimate level with us. He references God as father the most. Now, for those of you, and I love my feminist friends, because I'm always butting heads with you all, and I learned such amazing things, the title of father is not this patriarchal, domineering, controlling, masculine, put my foot on your neck. It is the imagery of God as the initiator and protector. God does not have male genitalia, newsflash. So when we use a male title, we are not referring to his biology. We are referring to an imagery of one of his characteristics. But here's where I'll mess all my macho friends up. God is also mother. And then it just got quiet. Ouch. The multi-breasted one is the literal translation in the Old Testament. It is God, the imagery of God, nursing and nurturing us, drawing us near, giving us life. In the beginning, he created the male and female. The masculine and feminine images of us reflect the essence of who God is. Male is not opposite from female. Female is not opposite from male. They are both complementary and connected. And so when we talk about God as father, we also need to talk about the image of God as mother. Because some of us, it's hard to understand that. So God as the great initiator who moves toward us. We are the great receivers. So all my female friends who get all bent out of shape about brothers in the New Testament, get over it because this is how it goes for all eternity. I'm going to be wearing a dress because he's going to refer to me as the bride. Just think a moment, people of God. Come on, go outside the box a little. All right? Because he is the pursuer and I am the pursuit. And so it is God naming us. I kneel before the Father of lights who all families in heaven and in earth derive their name. Part of the essence of the masculinity of God and his characteristic, and us as men, by the way, should be to correctly name things as they are and call things into their identity. God names us. Whatever names you, shames you and claims you. You better listen. Whatever is naming you, shames you and claims you. If you do not get named of the Father or named correctly by your parents, and I'm not talking about your hippie name, I'm just talking about how they see you, then you will name yourself something that's not true, or the world will name you it. Such were some of you, but now you are children of the light. Because God translates us out of that dark, deep place where I am named shamed, and naked, and broken, and bound, and he now says, you are mine. And I love you. Kids are a very strange thing. I'm a school teacher by trade. I used to teach special ed for a number of years. So I think I know a few things, plus I have a few. They eat all the time. They're loud. They poop everywhere, man. You have to change those ducks. You just changed it once and they do it again. It's like, come on already. Could you just empty it all at the same time? You know, and then when you have boys, that's a whole nother mess. Let's just put that thing where it is. And then you're just like, oh, my God. And then you look at them, and you're like, oh, my God, you're so adorable. I just love you. I just love you. Are you high? They don't even have a job. <laughs> if in the natural, that's how we are, how much more in the spiritual is God toward us? He loves us so much. He names us and moves toward us and calls us his own. And then the father sends the son, and then we move into this whole other weird phase of our relationship with God. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. And then he comes and he messes up our whole understanding of the relationship by going, I no longer call you slaves or servants, 
but now I call you friends. He steps into humanity at a level of co-equalness and says, I walk beside you. I am intimate with you. I share my heart and my thoughts with you. And I don't call you servants. I call you friends. So even if you can't relate to God as Father, relate to Jesus as your friend. That should mess you up at some level to think that the God who created you that breathes all this into being goes... I'm choosing to be in relationship with you at your level. I still maintain all my divinity. I still maintain all the essence of the fully redeemed human. But I'm choosing you. You did not choose me. And see, this is where we need to be resourced as the people of God. God, the great initiator, always coming to us to reveal who he is to us. It's not us running after him. It's him running after me. Now, for those of you who are concerned about, like, God and how things are working, I don't have the answers for that, but I do know this. God as Father always is invitational. He always invites us. He always calls us near. He always includes us. And so we have here Jesus, the friend of God, And how powerful is this that in the selection of all his apostles, he still calls the one who betrays him his friend. You've got to be a pretty secure person to be able to do that. Does that make sense? Like here is Jesus going, you're my friend. And I care about you. To the very end. So then... Jesus, we have the Father introducing Jesus, Jesus introducing the Father, and then Jesus comes along and introduces the Holy Spirit, which really messes everything up, because up to that point, people knew he was kind of in the background. But think about this about the Holy Spirit, and let me give you these characteristics. Comforting, nearness, intimacy. Yeah, those are pretty masculine characteristics. You know, I call my buds up and go, let's bond. I just feel like talking to you today. Right? Those are very feminine characteristics, which is why we have such a hard time with the Holy Spirit and we want to hijack him to power rather than to relationship. Because here's what he says I'm going to send you another, the comforter, which literally in the Greek is translated orphans because it means comfortless ones. Those who have no name, no rights. No protection, no provision. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm still naming you as my own. But he will lead you into all truth. Because if you have kids, you learn this really fast. When you tell a kid not to do something and then they do it. Now, as a man, we ask the dumbest questions on the face of the planet. Why'd you do that? Because they're a kid, duh. That's why they did it. But when kids are really emotionally upset, that's not the point to have the truth talk with them and try to get them to rationalize and understand the bad decisions. You have to calm their emotions down. Then you have the truth talk, right? That's the image of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to calm you down so you can hear the truth that's going to set you free. Now, sometimes the truth will just kill you, people. It just has to set you free, you know. Problem with the living sacrifice is you keep crawling off the dang altar. Right? Here am I, God. Well, just this arm today. You all know it. Come on, people of God. Be honest. Own your your junk. But here's the comforter coming, and he says, I'll be with you all the time. So rather than God out there, it is God now residing in here. And for those of you that are fixated on eschatology, here's the answer. What are the signs and wonders? Well, don't worry about it. It's going to be, and here's, here's Robin's interpretation. There's going to be a lot of doo-doo. There's going to be some bad things that happen. This weird person shows up. That weird person shows up. This thing happens. There's some war there. Ah, a little plague, kind of pestilence. Not sure why that's going on. All of it seems to melt down. But in the end, I win. So just hang on and hold on to me. And stop worrying about it. And then they're like, well, where's the kingdom? And what does Jesus say? The kingdom of God is within you. I bring the kingdom with me. I don't wait for the kingdom to show up. Because if I show up, part of the kingdom must be coming with me. Right? So here's Jesus the Father. Very strong image. 
God, Jesus, or God the Father, God, Jesus uses it the most. The greatest image used of us in the New Testament is children. And what I want to pull back from us, by the way, I just have to go a little over here, is if I hear another person talk to me about Jesus as their personal lover, I'm going to vomit a major organ. Jesus is not my personal lover. I'm his beloved, but he is not my lover. He's the lover of my soul. Understand the difference? But he's not my boyfriend or girlfriend. God is not tied to my needs. We have created God in the image of my pain. Whatever my pain is, I picture God the opposite. It takes God to reveal God to us. And so we have to go to him and start with the truth, not start with the problem and work backwards. Does that make sense? And so I want the fullness of the expression of God who has so many names because his name is so amazing. There's a story where the angel comes to one of the patriarchs and he says, tell me your name, right? And I love the translation because the actual translation is, my name is so long, so amazing, so incredible, so incomprehensible, we don't have enough time for me to tell it to you. That's just an angel. Imagine what the Lord's names are. We'll have all eternity to meditate on what does it mean for God to be this. Who God is, what God says, and what God does all lines up. There is no disconnect. If he says he is love, then he acts in love. He is love. If he says he is mercy, then he moves in mercy and he responds in mercy. We have long lived through a whole season where God is angry and judging some demographic that I don't belong to. Should I say that one more time? Yes. A long season of God as angry judge, always against some demographic, demographic that I do not belong to. No. For God so loved that he did what? Crap slapped the group that he doesn't like. No. He gave who he loves. He gave his only begotten son, the thing that cost him the most. So we can be a people resourced in the trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We are invited into the love relationship that's between all of them to participate in that, but also to manifest that. Jesus loves, but love costs something, and it costs him everything. But imagine that. Imagine if you have a child, and you're like, okay, here's the choice. Sacrifice this child to save everyone or save the child. Do you understand? God gave the best of what he had because you were worth it. He loves you amazingly and unconditionally. Now, God always puts clarifiers, and that's the hard part for us to live in is that tension. I call you friends, but then later Jesus says, who is my friend, whoever does what? The will of my father. It's like, oh, suck. I like the first part. The second part was kind of, you know, I'm, I have some issues with that one. Right? And that's the tension of grace. That's what I call it. The tension of grace we have to live in. There's unconditional love, but there are invitations and expectations. Right? I don't want to be doing sin management my whole life. I don't want to be doing self-improvement. I want to be transformed. Otherwise, let's all go to the country club and have a mimosa. Right? I didn't sign up for that. I signed up for my life to be radically different to allow the life of Christ to exude and be imbued in me to a dying world. The battle over your life is not following Jesus. The battle over your life is whether you will fulfill the call of God. You have to let that sink in. There are plenty of people that are following Jesus but not fulfilling the call. Churches are full of those. You want to be a people that advance the kingdom in love. Now, here's the transition. The New Testament in Revelation says the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And 
the transition, the reason I'm giving this background is because if we don't understand that we're a loved people and beloved of the Lord and the love relationship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, then everything we speak and do will be out of a place other than love. It will be by duty, it will be by guilt, it will be by coercion, it will be to check the list of righteousness, I've done the good deeds, and it will be nothing in the end. Remember it talks about men and women's works being tested by what? Fire. That's a pretty scary thing for me. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking there's a lot of stuff I did that's going to get burnt right up. I don't want my stuff to get burnt up. Right? So here's a dream I've had. I probably have shared this before. This is how I know I'm getting older because all my kids go, we heard that. Um, in this dream, I'm standing with my nose against something like, and it's really tall. It's like 23 stories tall. Who knows? It's really tall. And as I step back, I realize it's a gigantic refrigerator. Okay, just go with the flow here, people. Those of you who are really literal, just allegory. Think allegory, okay? And over here, I hear, like, the father and son at the bistro table, and the Holy Spirit's making a frappuccino, okay? I just, I just don't know how to describe this any other way. And I'm like, this is seriously whacked right now. I'm losing my mind, Jesus. But as I'm looking at this refrigerator, I see pictures with kids' names on them. Right? Do you know in every culture people do this? It's a very strange thing. Every culture kids draw, kids play, kids sing, kids dance. Kids are amazing. There's something about us needing to be childlike, just not childish, by the way. Right? Some of you need to learn how to be children before you can be adults. And so in our response to Jesus, here's, I hear this conversation, and here's what God the Father and God the Son, which I don't know how this works, are talking, and they go, oh, do you see my daughter Anne over there? She's amazing. Look what she's trying to do. She's trying out for gymnastics. She's so awesome. She, she's got a call in her life. She loves animals. She's going to be a veterinarian someday. Oh, look, look at my son Dan. Daniel over there, he's got such a strong sense of justice. And I think he's amazing. And this whole conversation's going on, and they're just picking on all these pictures and the whole thing, and the Holy Spirit's chiming in, going, isn't that great? They're so awesome. It's so great. You sound a little like a Jewish mom, but that point aside. Um, but then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit starts speaking. What does Jesus say about the Holy Spirit? I will send you another, and he will speak of what he hears. What is the Holy Spirit hearing? The love conversation between the Father and the Son about you and me. In the church, we talk about conviction only in terms of sin. But in 1 John, it says, my spirit testifies with his spirit that I am what? A children of God, a child of God. That same word is conviction. We are convinced we are children of God. So we have hijacked the Holy Spirit to be the sin, the sin citation person in heaven. Well, you screwed that up today. One more demerit. Third rung of hell, at least for a millennial. Um, you know, do you understand? That's what we've done. When the whole time the Holy Spirit is going, here's a better way. Here's a healthier way. Here's truth that will set you free. Here's wisdom that will equip you. Here's a new way of thinking. Here's what I'm offering you. Here's how much Jesus loves you. That's a bigger, harder pill to swallow. When I was a school teacher, I was, what a surprise, I was the unofficial disciplinarian because I'd always walk the kids down the hall of truth. It was Mr. M's hall of truth. So I'd always have some kid being a kid and we'd walk down the hall and talk about choices, consequences, alternative choices and consequences. And this one kid that was always a thorn in my side who just was so strong-willed, I was like, I was like, oh, you didn't get it. We're going to have to go down the Hall of Truth a couple more times. And this is what he says to me. Mr. M, Mr. M, please, I can't walk the Hall of Truth anymore. Just smack me and get it over with. <laughs> By the way, that's how most of you are with the Lord. You want to be smacked because that's easier to deal with than the Lord going, let me hug you. Ah, uh, now we had an aha moment, didn't we? That will mess you up more. Love will ruin you. When you look in the face of love that says, I see all your warts, I see all your rebellion, I see all your sin, and guess what? I have power over it, and I still call you my own. 
That's why the image of your children doesn't matter what they do, how messy they are, they're still your kids because they carry your name or your DNA. That's the way it is with us and God. We are named of him, we carry his identity, we carry his spiritual DNA. That's what the world needs to understand. It is not an exclusive family, it is an inclusive family. Come and be named of the Lord. Come and be embraced. Come and be enfolded. Come be restored. Come be loved on. Come be comforted. Who would not want that? So when we come to the prophetic, if we understand that, when Jesus steps into our midst and starts speaking to us and revealing our hearts and revealing his heart to us, then we understand it's always invitational. It's always to name us as beloved and accepted and included. The gift of prophecy is one of those interesting gifts, and I'm already starting with the presumption that the gifts are for today, so I don't have time to debate that with all of you. Here's the reality. It is God through the Holy Spirit taking a highlighter and the revealed word just highlighting something there that he wants us to get more of. And he does amazing things with it. God is alive and speaking today. It does not add to the canon. It does not subtract. The final doctrine or revealed canon is in print, ladies and gentlemen. We have no new things to say. Sorry, that, that series is over. But he has lots to say to animate it and highlight it and make it real to us. And I have story after story and experience after experience where God reaches out to the least, the lowly, the lost, and those who don't even like him and him talk to them about things in their lives. It's why in the Bible it says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, but especially the gift of prophecy. Because it's for edification, exhortation, consolation, and equipping. It does not go outside the scope of what the word reveals. It does not add to it. It has three aspects to it, which is it's always partial in the New Testament because I'm only, we're only getting a part of the picture. It's progressive, which means he always adds truth and revelation, and it's provisional, which means sometimes it demands a response from us, even if the response is only, thank you, Jesus, for talking to me, okay? It comes in three, kind of a three-process way. It comes through Revelation, which is the picture, the word, the idea. Then there's interpretation, which is where it gets messy with us as people. And application has to do with the timing and how we deliver it to people. And I, for one, am actually very exasperated that the prophetic has been hijacked to a adjective to make things in the church hot and sexy that are now boring. We're going to have prophetic worship versus just boring, plain old worship. Um, we're doing prophetic intercession this week versus regular old boring intercession this week. I went, why don't you just do the whole thing? We're doing prophetic parking. We're doing prophetic greeting. We're having prophetic child service. Like, stop. That's not. And then we have the other extreme where the prophetic means the weirder it is and the stranger it is, it must be anointed and of the Lord. He said be a peculiar people, not weird. Some of us live in that reality. I'm just a peculiar person for Jesus. No, you are weird. Medication, therapy, and a timeout. Please, now. <laughs> just go away for a while. Um, the prophetic is not to obscure things. It's to reveal things. But the one thing in that list that the prophetic is not supposed to do is, notice there isn't any sin naming there. Right? I was at a retreat one time that they brought in this supposed prophetic person. I got myself in trouble, I'm sure you can imagine. Because the person in the classic old Pentecostal style stood up front and the first thing out of this person's mouth was, there's sin in the camp. And I, without thinking, said, yes, that's because you showed up. <laughs> I live in a mortal body. Which part of the day do you want to know which sin? Do you understand? Where sin abounds, what? Grace abounds more. That messes most pastors up, by the way. Ah, don't sin a lot more just to get more grace. Um, Paul corrected that because that's what they said. 
It always empowers us, it encourages us, it equips us. It enables us to fulfill the call and to follow Jesus. That's the point of it. It is at the service of the body. It's not my ministry. It belongs to the Holy Spirit. It's not my gift. It's his. The gifts are temporary, but the fruit is permanent. We shouldn't be forced to choose between one or the other. You need both because what makes the gifts attractive is the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit is fragrant, aromatic, colorful, tasteful. That's the whole point of fruit. And most fruit is at our access level. So people can easily pick it. So when we fuse the gifts of the Spirit with the fruit, which is singular, by the way, then we have a very attractive package that people are willing to partake of, don't we? Right? Power without humility is an ego trip. But fruit without power is like cheap candy, by the way. It looks good, it tastes good, but there's not much oomph in it to bring transformation. We need both. Now, on this mode, power is easy to get. Authority is a completely different thing. Because it says Jesus was anointed with what? Power and authority. It also says that Jesus grew, progression, by the way, in favor and in stature, two different descriptors, in with God and man. We need to learn to grow in favor and stature with God and men. Some things take time. The prophetic is the invitation of the kingdom in the moment to say God is here, God sees, God knows you, God knows your names, he knows your circumstances, he knows your situations, he's involved. It is not a descriptor, it is a prescriptor. It is a prescription for the kingdom. Do you ever notice how some people have this gift of STO, stating the obvious? I really sense you're struggling right now. The fact that I look disheveled and I'm like, oh, you, you needed a word for that? Like, come on already. Right? It is not just generic encouragement. There is power behind it, and I've seen God do amazing things. God sees us and cares for us. And I've seen God step into people's lives and change them in ways that nothing short of God's intervention through the prophetic does. The prophetic is to encourage the body. It informs us of the mind of God in a moment. But it is to be tested and discerned in the body. The greatest gift the body needs is discernment. We keep saying yes to the dumbest things. I blame the hippies for everything. Sorry. It's all good. No, it's not all good. There are some things that are wrong, some things that are immature, and some things are just demonic. And we just have to say no. But we're invested in the growth and the risk of this. And it gets messy, which is why people don't like doing it. So I told this the other night. I'm in the pet store the other day. This happens to me all the time. Those of you who are into treasure hunts, I always laugh because the treasure always finds me. I don't have to go hunting for it. Do you know why? Because I carry the kingdom with me. And my critique of treasure hunts is this. What is the treasure? The power or the person? Hmm. Hmm. There's a theological conundrum. The treasure is the person, not the power. So when I go out, I take the kingdom with me. And there are days I avoid going out because I don't want to have conversations with people. I'm tired of the kingdom showing up. Please go away. I want to eat my salad. I'm not kidding you. So we're at the dog store because I need something for my, my dog. I love animals. And I come around the corner, and there's this gigantic pit bull, and he sits down and starts wagging his tail. And I could feel the presence of God show up. And I went, oh, no, here we go. <laughs> this is my response. I'm just being honest. This is how it works in my world. Because I just came for one little thing, and I go, here we go. There's this couple, and the Lord says, prophesy over the dog. I'm like, I'm not prophesying over the dog. This is the dumbest thing on the planet. It's not even theologically correct. You can't tell me to do that. And then all of a sudden, the verse comes into mine, and God opens Balaam's donkey's mouth. And I went, okay, fine. You could use a donkey. You can use me. I'll talk to the dog. So I guess, and she goes, as soon as I come around the corner, the dog sits down. She goes, that dog's never done that before. I don't understand. And I'm like, here we go. And I'm doing this. I'm making faces. It always gets me into trouble. My mom told me that. And um, 
I go, um, does your dog attack the other dog at home? She goes, yes, it does. Wait, how do you know we have another dog at home? Is it a small chihuahua dog? Yes, he bites its right ear. Yes. I'm like, I don't know where we're going with this, Jesus. <laughs> I'm literally going, you better help me out of this one. And then I get a picture of their bedroom, which, of course, leads to all sorts of other issues. And then I'm just going, um, does he sleep on the right side of the bed by you? Yes, he does. Wait, were you in our bedroom? How'd you get in our bedroom? And I'm like, I wasn't in your bedroom. He goes, how'd you know that? And so we're going through this whole thing, and I realize the man is picking up on the presence of the Lord, or husband. He can feel something. Because I'm watching him and out of the corner of my eye, and I can see him responding. He goes, what else do you know? In a very good way. I said, well, the dog is manifesting, not like demonically, by the way. Um, the dog is manifesting some of the conflict. Have you guys been going through a hard season in your marriage? They go, well, we're not really married, but we've been together a long time. But yes. And he goes, how do you know that? I said, well, I'll answer that question later. Well, let's just go with this and see what happens, okay? So we're going through the whole thing, and then we're talking, and then they ask more questions. This is an hour and a half of this. Hour and a half. The hardest thing for us to sacrifice in the kingdom of God is what? Hi. Exactly. Nobody wants to do it. I love how the church goes, let's have revival. No, you don't want revival. You're messy. It takes time. Who's going to change all those baby diapers? That's a lot of doo-doo to deal with out there. No, you don't want revival. You want reformation. Trust me. By the way, that was a little hint because my Bible says nowhere to pray for revival. It says pray for the kingdom to come. Ouch, that sacred cow just went down mooing. <laughs> a couple more of those are going to go before the end, trust me. We're paying for revival. Oh, no, pray for the kingdom. So, hour and a half later, we go through this whole thing. They ask me questions about their marriage. I give them advice about the dog. I'm like getting prophetic advice what to do with the dog. She's like, oh, I should try that. Yeah, I said, you know, when you come in, make sure your husband says hi to the dog, pets the dog, and then we're going through the whole thing. I'm like, that is just such a good idea. And she, we're going through this whole conversation. And then she's like, well, thanks. Hopefully we run into you again. I get in the car and drive home, and I go, dang it, I didn't get what I came to the dog store for. <laughs> Jesus goes, that was the only reason I sent you there. <laughs> that was it. Now, what do you do with that? Here's what you do with that. God stepped down and just wanted them to know he cared, and that's all I told them. I said, the way I know this is because God just shows up sometimes and whispers things to me. Can, can I ask him some questions, by the way? Because I have a few questions for him. Do you think he would respond to you if you asked him? Do you hear the hunger? And I was like, do you weave them to the Lord? Do I do the four steps? Four spiritual laws, that stupid track that no one could understand. Um, all the older saints understand. I, said, I never got those pictures. And I have an artist background. I'm like, what? My chair and throne and heart. and oh, I'm so glad we're past all that. And the Lord's like, no, just tell them I love them. They're like, okay. That was the end of that. I have story after story of things like this. Where God shows up and just wants people to know. For those of you who were here last year, you know what happened in the, the, uh, a couple years ago, what happened in the square. They tricked me. They had a barbecue, and then they asked me to come. Unbeknownst to me, inviting other people to come to the barbecue because Robin was in town, and God's going to talk to you. Do you know what the funniest thing about that whole experience was? The hardest people to hear from the Lord were the Christians. I had non-Christians hugging me, kissing me even. I was like, okay, please go away. I'm really uncomfortable. Um, just received it. But the Christians were like, well, I don't know if that's theologically correct. And, you know, I'm kind of scared. And wait, did I check off my sin repentance list this week? What should I? Oh, wait. Lord, forgive me for that so he can't see that. Lord, forgive me for that so he can't see that. Like, I can hear this going on in people's heads. I'm like, really, people of God? Relax. God loves you. The blood is enough. It's so much enough. And so here's the prophetic reaching out to people because they can't be brought in, but we can go out to them. And it's as simple as God saying, I see you and I know where you're at and I care about you. And I've seen it over and over and over and over and all I do is show up. Really, it drives me crazy at times because God just wrecks my world and, he, and he, you know what? When you come to Jesus, you sign a blank check. He gets to cash it anytime he wants. I was like, come on, the count's running dry. So here's a couple more stories. I was at Yale or uh, Princeton a week ago at the seminary. I got asked to come and talk. That sounds really exciting, but I'm just like, okay, it's the seminary. How exciting. 
And I'm standing there, and I can feel the presence of God come into the room, and people are wanting to learn about this and hear this. And for the first time, and this has not happened to me before, I start seeing states behind people like a map. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do with this. First person, does Ohio mean anything to you? Oh, yeah, I'm from Ohio. God got their attention. Then we have a whole conversation, and God shares more things. That went to about five people. The Lord just revealing hearts to say, I'm in your midst, and I care. And the thing is, you all can do this. You just have to show up. You just have to say, Lord, give, give me a heart because you've got to love people to minister a message of love and to look past all the externalities. All the externalities. I know that the Spirit of God in me is powerful. I can minister and meet people. And I trust in Him. It's not your ability to hear. It's His ability to speak. Listen to that one again. It's not your ability to hear, it's his ability to speak. And guess what? He wants to talk to us. He wants to just share how much he loves us. The Bible is not a dead book of principles that I read like a lawnmower manual, and if I just follow the five easy steps, my life now is magically better. That's self-improvement. That's what most other religions are about. Guess what? It's about relationship. If you only go to Jesus for information, then that's all you're going to get. As Westerners, we are fixated on the will of God, not the ways of God. Because we do not trust God's ability to direct me or to lead me. So I only go to him and, Lord, if it's your will and show me your will, do you know what I've learned about God? God's big enough to direct me where I need to go. I ask for his will, but then it says the steps of the righteous are ordained of the Lord. I trust him to correct me and direct me. I don't freak out about his will. It's a very Western thing, by the way. Why do you think we're eschatologically fixated? I live in California where we have signs on the freeway that say 10 minutes, 20 minutes to something, you know, traffic backed up. That doesn't change the speed of traffic. It just keeps us from shooting each other. <laughs> and everybody slows down to read it, like as if we're illiterate, too, on top of it. And I'm just like, it's just anxiety management. Our fixation on end times is anxiety management because we don't trust that God really is who he is, that he says he's going to do what he says he's going to do, that he's the God who comes to redeem and save, and in the end, it does work out. So people of God, take a major chill pill. You need a spiritual Xanax for God's sakes. My Bible says, when you see these things, lift up your head and rejoice. My Bible also says the meek shall inherit the earth and the Christians are the first ones trying to get out of here. Think about that a minute. The meek shall inherit the earth and we're like, get me out of here. Get me out. Not of this world. Yeah, you look pretty alien. Please shut up right now. It says to be in the world, not of it. Too often we are of the world, just not in it. Right? So I want to be a f transformed people, an invitational people. When I worked in patient crisis counseling, we had a kid that had a psychological break. It's the first series, schizophrenia, and particularly paranoid schizophrenia, follows a pretty consistent pattern. There has to be three clear psychotic breaks. The true psychotic breaks is you walking down Main Street with a lampshade on your head naked because aliens are about to steal your thoughts. You just have no idea where you're at, what's going on. So we had three of these. And the parents were very distraught. It was a poor ethnic family that this type of thing is not something we talk about or address. And one day I came walking in and he came running down the hall in full force at me and they thought he was attacking me, going to attack me. And he didn't attack me, he just grabbed a hold. I told him to relax because I, I work with this kid for a while now. He's 20 years old and he was very tormented in his mind, I could see it. And he grabbed a hold of my shirt and he put his head on my shoulder and he started rocking back and forth. And his name, I forget his name and I wouldn't say it anyway, but I will say Michael or David for practical purposes. I said, what are you doing? And he just started humming to himself and he's rocking back and forth. And then he looks up to me in his eyes and I see his eyes are clear and he says, when I hold on to you, my mind comes back and I can think again. That's the kingdom. Should he be on medication? Sure. Am I gonna, was I praying for him? All the time. 
But that's the kingdom you should carry, isn't it? To be a people of peace. To be a people that peace has a weight because it says the God of peace crushes Satan under our feet, not the God of warfare, not the God of triumphalism, not the God of conquering, but the God of peace because peace has such a huge weight. Do you know many non-believers or seekers or wherever place they are in their life, I just go, can I bless you with peace? And I pray for them. I have people cry because they're like, what are you doing to me? I go, I'm not doing it. anything. They're like, oh my God. I go, that's it. They're like, what? Oh my God. I go, yeah, that God thing. Oh, that's God. <laughs> they're like, what do I do? I just go, just tell them, Lord, help me. Right? I want to be a servant that bows down and washes the feet of people. We keep saying we want to be a faceless generation and then we post everything on the internet about ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. If, if I can't document it or YouTube it, it's not worth doing. How about just doing it and nobody know about it? There are things that God's asked me to do and people I've ministered to I tell nobody about. Usually I get texts from one of the boys going, where are you? Is it a homeless person or another one of those weird kingdom things I get? Because I disappear for a couple hours. Happens all the time. God is a God who cares about us. He's alive and active. He wants to speak to his people to bring his word to life, not to add something weird to it, not to be crazy about it, in very natural ways to have conversation with us, to invite people into that love relationship that we should be living in. Does that make sense? You all can do this. This is not rocket science. It really isn't. The reason in Corinthians it's listed is because it was so normative for the early church that Paul finally had to put some parameters on it. Right? Okay, when you all gather together and there's like three or four or five of you and you get words, one of you's got to sit down and shut up so the other one can talk. It doesn't say that exactly. That's kind of my version of it. Um, but you understand the precedent and the principle is that God talks to his people. He talks primarily first through the written revealed word. But then the Holy Spirit wants to come along with the highlighter. And most of you hear from the Holy Spirit, you don't even realize it's him. He isn't just there to convict you of sin or get you saved. He's there to transform you and empower you. He wants to empower you to be a people that transform a world. And you can do that. So, there's the background. There's the general idea. Let's see what God has in store. Okay? Okay.